Good, e good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this upcoming talk is Stop General Data Retention in the European Union and the current plans for mass surveillance. And it is not in German, as the power plan just, just suggests. It's all done in English. Uh, but this vortrag wird uh, also simultan übersetzt in Deutsch. Um, so that's the extent of my German. I will carry on uh, introducing the speakers. Um, the uh, Also not included in the lineup in the FAR plan is Friedemann L. Ebbelt, a freelance campaigner in Germany against data retention. Um, another German is joining us, that is Patrick Breyer, who is a uh, member of the European Parliament for the German Pirates. Um, and we stay in Brussels for a bit, a bit, little bit with, uh, uh, with Chloe Bettelimi, who is a policy advisor with European Digital Rights. Um, and we're also staying a little bit within European Digital Rights because we also have the chairman of the Danish NGO IT Pol, uh, Jesper Lund, and that group is also an EG member. And last but definitely not least, we have T.G. McIntyre, who is a lecturer at University College Dublin, but is also part of Digital Rights Ireland and is one of the brains together with Austrian NGOs and activists uh, behind the original DRI Ireland uh, case in, the, in front of the Court of, European, uh, of, of Justice of the European Union, which struck down data retention. Um, that was already in 2016. Time flies when you're getting old. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Friedemann, who's sort of moderating this panel. Thank you, Walter, um, for introducing this talk and welcome everybody to this talk on mass surveillance of our communication data in the European Union. And uh, also, thanks you for your interest in this uh, very important issue. Um, I had the joy to organize this talk and I will help to navigate a little through this uh, session. And the key questions of this talk are going to be um, what is data retention and uh, what are the problems? Also, what is the legal situation in the European Union? And uh, what are member state governments actually doing? Um, what is the Commission of the European Union doing? And uh, what's going on in the uh, European Parliament? Also important questions are... What's the situation in Germany? What's the situation in France, Ireland, Denmark, and Belgium? And um, what can we expect from the new year, from 2022 and uh, the future? And uh, of course, for many of you, one of the most important questions, um, what can citizens do about mass surveillance of communication data? Um, you will find more information on the speakers and you will find also the audio and video to download on media.ccc. You can just search for data retention. And uh, of course, if you like, you can recommend the talk to others. Um, in general, to follow the discussion on data retention during the year 2022 and beyond, you can use the hashtag data retention or the equivalent in your language in German, this would be Vorratsdatenspeicherung. Patrick Breyer, as the member of the European Parliament, uh, will start this talk uh, with uh, the question, what is data retention and uh, what are the problems? Thank you very much, uh, Friedemann, and thanks everybody for joining us for this talk. Data retention has been called the most privacy invasive scheme ever adopted by the European Union. But what does the term mean exactly? Now, data retention means that a record is kept by your providers on all phone calls you made and received, on all electronic messages you sent or received, as well as on the IP address that was assigned to each of your internet connections. So this means that the record does not contain the content of your calls and messages, but details on who you were communicating with at what time and in the case of mobile devices, where you were located. This record can be accessed by public authorities to investigate suspects of serious crime, but it will be created even if you are not suspected or in any way remotely connected to any crime. 
So what is the problem with creating this sea of personal data? For the first time with data retention, sensitive information is a must on the everyday social contacts, including business contacts, on the movements and on the private lives of millions of citizens that are not even remotely connected to any wrongdoing. The German Constitutional Court said that data retention has a broader range than anything in the legal system to date. And the idea of collecting information just in case you might need it in the future, that idea opens the floodgates to recording our entire lives, you know, including uh, uh, collecting our, our, um, our uh, travels using ANPR uh, data, um, facial recognition data, you name it. Um, this idea of retaining just in case is what is dangerous about this data retention. And that's why we are fighting this precedent so hard. It normalizes mass surveillance. Besides, a blanket telecommunications data retention has proven to be harmful to many sectors of society. It disrupts confidential communications in areas that legitimately require non-traceability. For example, contacts with psychotherapists, with physicians, lawyers, workers' councils, marriage counselors, drug abuse counselors, helplines, etc. It thus endangers the, the physical and mental health of people in need of support, as well as of people around them. For example, a German crisis line reported they once talked a student out of a killing spree that he was contemplating at his own school. And, you know, if you start recording information on these uh, contacts and people risk being prosecuted, they might no longer call and might not be possible to dissuade them from, from these kind of um, crimes. Furthermore, the inability of journalists to electronically receive information through untraceable channels compromises the freedom of the press, damages preconditions of our open and democratic society. Blanket data retention creates risks of data abuse and loss of confidential information relating to our contacts, movements, and interests. And communications data are particularly susceptible to producing unjustified suspicions and subjecting innocent citizens to criminal investigations because they relate to a connection point, not a specific person. And let me briefly explain why data retention is the problem and not the solution for law enforcement. It is, as I explained, a weapon of mass surveillance directed against the entire population. But on the other hand, the results are not even statistically significant. So neither the number of crimes nor the crime clearance rate that depends on whether you have data retention legislation in place in a country or not. So I've commissioned the European Parliament's research service to look at the statistics throughout the EU, and they didn't find one country where um, the, uh, the crime rate or the number of crimes depended on is a data retention law in effect or not. But you'd ex expect it, you know, considering the, 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 the breadth and mass of information that's being recorded. Obviously, there are typically other ways of clearing crimes than historical records, and also Blanket retention may have counterproductive effects, uh, pushing criminals uh, to other channels and making investigations even more difficult in some cases. And specifically, I want to say in relation to child pornography online, which is really the, the favorite, most popular argument that proponents use currently. Let me underline that in Germany, without mandatory data retention in force, 91% of all investigations of child pornography are cleared. And cr the, the cl crime clearance rate actually dropped when IP data retention came into force in Germany about 10 years ago. Besides, anonymous communications protects children by allowing for anonymous counseling that they are in need of, by allowing for anonymous self-help groups, by allowing them to anonymously file criminal charges. So don't be mistaken about um, the killer argument of, of child pornography 
it's an excuse, not a valid justification. Patrick, uh, since you explained uh, what uh, Planket or general data retention is all about, it seems pretty clear that um, it's a huge problem in democracies and um, it's a huge problem for the freedom of our communications. But uh, how about the legal situation? And uh, this is uh, something TJ McIntyre, chairman of Digital Rights Ireland, uh, will explain us um, right now, TJ. Thanks, Freeman. So the situation here, if we go back to the early part of the 2000s, um, is that even in the run-up to 9-11, governments were using this kind of data retention essentially in secret, and they were getting telephone companies to retain this information without usually any real legal basis. And after that was exposed, the early part of the 2000s saw some national laws being rushed in in a hurry to try to legalize this practice. Um, but it also saw a lot of challenges brought by civil rights groups to these practices. And there were successful challenges in many individual countries on different uh, grounds in Germany, Romania, Bulgaria, and so on. But what was most interesting from my perspective was when the battle shifted to the European level, because there was a move to introduce a European law which would require data retention across all of Europe, um, which was eventually adopted as the so-called data retention directive. And... We um, in Digital Rights Ireland, along with um, colleagues from many other civil rights groups, brought actions seeking to challenge this. And eventually we were successful in doing so before the European Court of Justice in 2014, which invalidated the directive on the basis that it was essentially disproportionate and a growth invasion of privacy, one that created real risks of abuse. If we had a piece of legislation which involved creating these huge dossiers of data on everybody indiscriminately. so. That was 2014, and since then we've seen massive national pushback against this finding that this kind of indiscriminate data retention um, is disproportionate and therefore contrary to European law. And we've seen multiple cases since then where national governments have tried to persuade the European Court of Justice to change its tack. There was a judgment in 2016 in a case brought by um, litigants from the United Kingdom and from Sweden, the Tele2 um, and Davis and Watson case. Um, there was a judgment in 2018 um, in a case arising from Spain. There was a judgment in 2020 um, in a case coming from um, France and the United Kingdom, the Quattro Trudinette and the Privacy International joint cases. And again and again and again, what national governments have tried to do is to persuade the European Court of Justice that it was wrong in 2014, that this finding that mass indiscriminate surveillance is unacceptable in a democratic society should be rolled back. Now, to my mind, what's very interesting is what's happening at the moment, because there is yet another of these cases, in fact, three parallel cases before the European Court of Justice at the moment, um, where national governments have essentially again tried to uh, square up to the European Court of Justice, where collectively, and this is really quite remarkable, I don't think we've ever seen such a coordinated set of national disobedience to court rulings before, where collectively national governments across the EU have tried to say to the European Court of Justice, we need this kind of mass surveillance, though without producing any evidence to show that it's in fact necessary, as Patrick points out. We need this kind of mass surveillance. We think you are wrong. We want you to change your mind on this. So this to me is rather worrying because it shows, I think, a degree of lawlessness here. National governments are unwilling to accept the findings of the highest court in Europe on this point. In some countries, in Ireland, for example, the law in this area hasn't been changed at all. Despite the multiple judgments in this area, Irish law remains as it was in 2011, so predating all these cases. And the Irish government has essentially indicated that it plans to keep that law in place until it is forced by the judgment of a national court to um, do away with it. So we have, I think, a very difficult situation here. In one sense, of course, we've been very lucky. We've achieved a number of very important judgments from the European Court of Justice. Um, we have a court there whose members understand the importance of this issue. But as against that, you have a real problem here with national pushback and a desire to eventually 
force down the court and perhaps wait until the composition of the court changes in future and get more favorable precedents. So I think from that perspective, it's very important that at a national level, we push to increase the political pressure against these laws. And as far as we can, at a European level, we try to push the commission to act, to take steps um, against member states that have refused to implement judgments of the European Court of Justice and to ensure compliance with European law. Thank you, TJ. Now, um, following the legal situation, let us have a look at the implementation of law. And here, one of the or maybe the most important players in the European Union is uh, the Commission of the European Union. And uh, this question goes to Jesper Lann, chairman of uh, the IT Political Association of Denmark. Um, Jesper, what is going on at the, the Commission? Um, thank you, Friedemann. So it's essentially, ever since the data retention directive was annulled in, in 2014, there has been an ongoing discussion. Is there going to be a new data retention instrument at the at the EU level? Um, and so besides waiting for the commission, this discussion has also been going on in various working groups of, of council where, where member states meet in secret. Um, uh, fortunately, some of their documents are leaked or obtained through freedom of information access requests. So we sort of know from this process that, that as, as TJ mentioned, member states are in complete denial. They refuse to accept that general and indiscriminate data retention is, is illegal um, and try to um, to move on from, from that starting point. So most, uh, most recently, um, I think the commission has sort of taken a uh, hold, uh, wait and see attitude, uh, wait for the next judgment. But after the lack of the two adjustment uh, in uh, October last year, um, the commission has come forward uh, with a non-paper uh, in June, which uh, generated a lot of attention. Um, so it's, it's mostly a paper that that asks questions to uh, to member states. But so read between the lines of the paper, we can also see what what plans the commission uh, might have for a not necessarily a new data retention law that is one of the options um, for member states. It could also be guidance for for, for member states. Um, but sort of going going through the uh, the, the paper, uh, it it follows roughly the the, the judgment of, of in in the like the Tour case. Um, one novel aspect of that is that the court reaffirmed that we cannot have mass surveillance, general and indiscriminate data retention for the purpose of combating even serious crime. But it is possible, unfortunately, uh, the court said it is possible in certain cases to have general and indiscriminate data retention for national security. If there is a serious threat to national security that is um, uh, uh, genuine and, and present and foreseeable. It's pretty clear from my reading of the judgment that this must be an extraordinary, extraordinary situation where surveilling everybody for a short time can help prevent a very serious threat to, to national security. But the commission is, is using that and member states are also doing that. Uh, we'll get to that later. Using that as sort of a um, starting point to uh, to have general and indiscriminate um, uh, data retention. So the commission asks, even though national security is the sole competence of the member states, and the commission is very unsure of any legal basis here, um, whether there should be an EU instrument um, on data retention for national security. One thing to note here is that this might be even worse than the data retention directive, because the commission indicates that this should not just cover telecommunication services as the data retention directive did, but also so-called over-the-top providers, OTTs, which would be services like Signal, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, um, and so forth. Um, and this could potentially be a, an EU legislative initiative, whereas perhaps data retention for traditional telecommunication services could remain with member states. So the Commission is also suggesting that there could be a mixed approach of, of national legislation and, and EU legislation. Um, the Commission is also asking member states about targeted data retention. This is what the uh, the court has said since, um, essentially since the first judgment that general and indiscriminate uh, data retention is not allowed, 
but targeted data retention uh, could be allowed or is allowed by, by, by EU law. Um, unfortunately, what the Commission does in this area is so to take every hint in the lack of the two adjustment and sort of amplify it to make targeted data retention cover as much as possible. Um, it's pretty clear from the judgment that targeted data retention has to be the exception, not the rule. It cannot cover half of the population, but this part is sort of forgotten by, by, by the commission in the, in, in, in the non-paper. So they mention a long list of areas, critical infrastructure, transport hubs, and then areas with above average crime rates. This is not exactly what the court said. It said specific areas of high incidence of, of crimes or above average could very easily uh, include last part of um, a member state. And then on the person-based uh, targeted data retention, it sort of mentions almost everybody who could be of interest to the police, known organized groups, individuals convicted of serious crime, individuals who have been subject to a lawful interception order, uh, individuals and on watch lists and so forth. Um, if we know the, the tendency of the police and secret services to to uh, to put people on on watch lists um, in in secret uh, that this can presumably be, be very long. Um, in connection the, with this, it actually gets even worse because in connection with targeted data retention, the commission mentions the idea of having um, subscriber information collected on everybody and verified subscriber information, including mandatory an EU-wide uh, mandatory um, obligation to to have registration of anonymous SIM cards, pay-as-you-go SIM cards. And this is sort of justified by the targeted data retention. We need to make sure that the, the right persons can be targeted. Um, the non-paper also mentions quick freeze or expedited retention. This is interesting because quick freeze uh, um, data preservation is what civil society has called for as, as the alternative to, to data retention basically ever since the, uh, the mid-2000s. Um, and finally, it goes into the uh, generalized retention of IP addresses, which the Court of Justice fortunately uh, allowed on a, on a general and indiscriminate basis uh, in the Lacroix 2 adjustment, but limited to, to serious crime. Um, so looking at the questions, the uh, Commission is asking member states whether sufficient, um, whether all relevant cyber crimes are covered by their notion of, of serious crime. Let me brief, briefly, in, in conclusion, mention some of the member states' reaction to this. Um, State Watch did a freedom of information access request with the Commission to get uh, a response from member states. Um, most of them refused, um, but but some, um, uh, Denmark, Finland, Germany, Hungary, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Sweden, uh, um, provided their responses. In general, they want an EU uh, instrument, um, but they're not interested in having that cover on national security. They are also not too keen on targeted data retention, and they don't really like the idea of, of, of quick freeze. So it's not enti entirely clear what, what this um, EU instrument should, should cover, um, except, well, they want general you know, industry and data retention for everything, uh, but they can't have that. And that has sort of been the, uh, that is their total state of denial, which has been going on since the, um, since the first judgment in, in 2014. Let me let me stop here um, as as the summary of, of the of the present EU initiative, um, and we'll continue later. Thank you, um, Jasper. So um, the Commission um, is communicating and uh, negotiating a lot with uh, member state governments, and uh, the aim seems to be to find new ways for more mass surveillance. So, um, of course, the question is, how do national governments um, in the European Union treat fundamental rights and respond to the legal situation? Um, so what is going on in EU member states? Um, and uh, maybe let, uh, let us start with France, where Chloe from Adri can tell us about the situation. Introduce a little bit maybe the work of our uh, Edry member in France. So, Net Edry is a, is a network of members, and one of them is La Quadrature de Net, and um, they were among the main. Uh, 
pictures. Mm, would this one work? Yes, okay, sorry about that. Um, yes, so I wanted to talk about like the work of La Quadrature du Net, our uh, Edry member in France. Um, sorry for all the technical details. Um, they were one of the main plaintiffs that led to the um, landmark ruling La Quadrature du Net that was mentioned already a couple of times now. Um, and they brought this case, like the procedure started already in 2015. Um, they went in front of the Council of State in France uh, after the uh, first um, ruling by the Court of Justice of the European Union um, in Digital Rights Ireland and wanted to have the legal uh, framework in France uh, removed or annulled um, by the Council of State. And obviously, uh, that wasn't to the taste of the highest administrative uh, court in France, and they decided to refer yet another question to the Court of Justice. Um, that led to the famous ruling in 2020, uh, in October, um, saying that the national legal framework in France is actually contrary to um, EU law and to the Charter of Fundamental Rights. But unfortunately, what the kind of the aftermath of this ruling in October 2020 shows us is that. France is possibly one of the most aggressive, offensive uh, member states in the EU who is willing to um, really pay the, the price and the high price to keep its mass retention regime in place. Um, the reason why I'm saying this is because the government made a huge advocacy campaign towards the Council of State, so the highest administrative court again, uh, charged to actually give its decision after the CGU ruling. Um, they submitted uh, weeks before uh, the decision was released by the Council of State a statement um, of case. And um, in this statement of case, they, argue, they argued that the Court of Justice of the European Union would have actually had um, abused its powers um, and actually wanted to uh, advise the Council of State to ignore everything that the court has said and mentioned that this is way beyond its jurisdiction to actually limit member states in the EU um, with anything related to the fight against terrorism or every, everything related to uh, national security. And therefore, uh, the ruling should be completely ignored. Um, the uh, Council of State more or less uh, followed this government approach, uh, obviously not as radical position as the French uh, government uh, uh, um, said, because I think it was reported even in the press that at one point the French government uh, was really willing to even uh, negotiate a reopening of the EU treaties um, and uh, notably the Charter of Fundamental they would go as far as uh, going against the primary law of the European Union to change it in order to accommodate France's needs in terms of national security, which was pretty strong and um, quite telling in terms of like the contradiction that there is with uh, France's typical kind of reputation as a pro-European Union integration leader, as a, like, uh, a reputation it has to just drive uh, EU integration forward and be pro-European in general. Um, so they're really willing to jeopardize their position as uh, a strategic position in those fields um, just to keep mass surveillance in place. And so to all appearance, even if the Council of State said that the decrease in place in tw since 2015 should be revised, um, they largely actually gave the legislator all the keys and solutions, uh, corrective solutions to just maintain uh, the, the surveillance uh, regime in place. And so how it did that, it's, I'm not going to go through the entire judgment because it's rich and there is a lot of um, conclusion that we could like analyze and it's super interesting and maybe one that is quite telling I would I would mention and that shows like how um, France is willing to do anything to keep its data retention in place and in the matter that is indiscriminate in general is the reinterpretation of the notion of national security and in this notion of national security it goes far beyond terrorism 
Um, and this was also like showcased during the hearing made by the Council of State just before it released its decision. There was the general, um, the director general of the intelligence services talking at the hearing and mentioning actually terrorism, we have all the legal tool at hand. It's not so much that we are limited in, in competence. What afraid us is more like the if we apply the CGE ruling now, we will have less power to actually surveil and spy on people who are at the kind of the forefront of social movements or who are organizing like demonstrations, who are engaged in social justice uh, fights and so on. And so in this context of, in this notion of national security, the Council of State is putting any threat to um, the economic interests of the French nation. So like they are thinking about economic espionage, but they're also thinking about um, mild, like drug trafficking, even like the smallest like networks in your like city, city suburbs, like that could also fall as a, as a threat to national security and justify the indiscriminate and general data retention. And then lastly, the organization of non-registered protests as a permanent threat to uh, public uh, peace, they call it public peace. And so that would justify um, a general kind of uh, threat to national, that would like demonstrate a nas uh, national th uh, threat to national security uh, permanently and allow France to keep its indiscriminate and general uh, data retention regime for good. Um, con completely contrary to what the Court of Justice said, obviously, um, and even going beyond what France has in, uh, in, in place until now. Uh, which was like the state of emergency. I think this is something that many of you probably heard um, in 2015 during the terrorist attacks. France reacted strongly, implemented a lot of measures that were anti-democratic, very like going against rights and freedoms. Um, that was supposed to be temporary. Unfortunately, following the ruling by the Court of Justice, um, and this is also a natural trend and flow, um, they decided to bring all those measures that were exceptionally allowed in exceptional times. And now they proposed recently um, in April, just a few weeks after, a month after actually uh, the, the decision of the Council of State, a, a reform um, that brings every, all of these measures into ordinary law. Um, so obviously what the Council of State has said indiscriminate general data retention, obviously always okay because there is constantly threats to national security, but there is obviously other um, uh, measures linked to house arrest, uh, use of drones, uh, uh, cooperation with private actors to enable government hacking into end device of users, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of this is packaged into one nice <laughs> little law. And the latest development that I can share with you in France is that um, the, um, the, the socialist in the parliament blocked um, a submission of this uh, bill to the Council, uh, the Constitutional Council of France, the only kind of institution that is left that kind of like control a little bit what the government has to say and put forward as, as, um, as legislation. Um, and unfortunately, um, the, the part of, uh, related, like the provision related to data retention in this uh, bill weren't submitted to the Constitutional Council, so they never had any say in this. And so now the project is adopted, and we just like, this is, voila, rubber stamped what the Council of State has decided for France. Um, and this will be very difficult in the future to attack again. Thank you, uh, Chloe. Um, I must admit that, um, it is extremely interesting to hear about the situation in France, but it's also extremely um, shocking um, to hear about the strong tensions um, in the relations between governments and courts and governments and the rule of law. Um, and now to everybody who's watching this talk live, you can send in your questions to the speakers. Um, by using the hashtag uh, RC3CWTV, because we are having a Q&A after, right after the talk. And uh, maybe we, we will come back to this um, point in the Q&A. Um, and the hashtag uh, is for Mastodon and Twitter. Um, 
since recently uh, there's a new government in Berlin and uh, also Germany is uh, next to or together with France a big and important player in uh, EU politics. Um, so also there's a new situation in Germany uh, with uh, data retention and of course First, this question goes to Patrick Breyer, as um, a German member of the European Parliament. Um, Patrick, uh, what can you tell us about uh, the situation in Germany? Well, legally speaking, uh, indiscriminate data retention legislation is in force, but it's not being applied due to pending court cases that have said that it, it violates the EU uh, um, case law and a Charter of Fundamental Rights. The European Court of Justice will rule, will decide next year on the uh, compatibility of the German regime with the, the European fundamental rights. And um, in the meantime, the new government has agreed that data should be retained on an ad hoc basis and by judicial order only. Now, on the one hand side, this excludes um, a sort of uh, indiscriminate and general regime. But on the other hand, after what you've, you've heard from previous speakers, you will know that it does not exclude, for example, a geographically targeted retention that could uh, cover vast parts of the country or above average crime rates and the like, like. Nor does it really exclude the retention of data uh, referring to a present or foreseeable national security threat, which uh, could also be said to be on an ad hoc basis. So um, we, we'll have to, to watch very closely what, what the government will do. Uh, the Liberals and the new Justice Minister are advocating for quick freeze. But there is a risk, for example, that in the pending procedure, the courts will not invalidate indiscriminate IP data retention. You know, saying that, that the European Court of Justice said, well, IP data retention is okay. And there is a risk that the coalition cannot agree, cannot find a majority to agree on abolishing it politically. So we'll, we'll have to see and, and um, watch very closely how the new government will behave also at a European level. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Um, you said there's a pending procedure on data retention in Germany, and I know there's also a uh, pending court case, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, on the national data retention regime in uh, Ireland and uh, TJ, um, what can you tell us about the situation in Ireland? So there are in fact three cases for the European Court of Justice at this moment. Um, one from Germany, one from Ireland and a parallel one from France. And what to me is very interesting about those cases is not so much the questions that are asked, but how the court has been dealing with the case. So the questions that are asked are basically the same questions over again. Can we have indiscriminate um, mass retention of data where we need it for dealing with serious crimes? That is essentially the question that the Irish court has asked. Again, it's basically putting it up to the European Court of Justice to change its mind. Um, and then the, the questions from um, <clears throat> Germany are very similar because we're dealing with the law, which is, again, indiscriminate, albeit that the German retention period has now been reduced to uh, approximately 10 weeks, I think, Patrick. Um, and the question from France is a slightly more technical question in a parallel area of law. But again, the national governments were taking the opportunity here to push the agenda of looking to rewind the time machine to 2014 prior to the Digital Rights Ireland judgment and go back to a situation where mass indiscriminate retention was allowed. What the court did, to my mind, which was very interesting in dealing with these cases, was it initially said, right, we're going to um, ask the national courts, do they really want us to hear these cases? After the Le Quadrature du Net um, judgment, the Court of Justice reached out to the Irish Supreme Court, for example, and said, but essentially, listen, um, we've already answered your question. Do you really want to go ahead with this case? Um, and in fact, the um, Advocate General suggested something um, even more um, dramatic, if you like, as a response, where he said that the response of the court should be um, to... Um, dispose of the case using Article 99 of the Rules of Procedure of the Court. Now, that might not sound very interesting, but Article 99 basically means you can take an incoming request from a national court and say, eh, we've dealt with this already, we don't need to hear this case, and we can dispose of it without a hearing. 
So the Advocate General, and I think the court itself, is intent here on sending a signal that we've decided, we've made up our minds regarding these cases. We're not interested in hearing more and more national cases coming back to us for national government's sake. Um, we'd really like you to change your mind now. The Court of Justice, to my mind, is about to send a signal here where it says, look, the law on this point is settled. Please go and try and implement that law in good faith, as opposed to coming back to us with ever more ingenious ways of arguing in favour of mass state retention. The real question, of course, is whether that's going to happen, um, whether national um, courts are going, national governments, I should say, um, are prepared to respect the rule of law, or whether, um, as Chloe pointed out, they're going to be prepared to continue to manufacture um, a crisis, to manufacture a collision between national law and European law for the sake of promoting this um, surveillance agenda. And unfortunately, um, I suspect that national governments are more likely to do the latter than the former. I think it is very likely that we'll continue to see pushback from them. Thank you. Um, next question goes to, to Jasper, um, and it would be, how is the signal that's um, how you, TJ, uh, framed what's going on? How is the signal from the European Court of Justice um, received in Denmark? Well, thank you, uh, Friedman. <coughs> Sorry. Well, um, the, the, the current Danish state retention law, uh, which is about to be updated, is essentially the uh, the old data retention directive. So general and indiscriminate uh, data retention of telecommunication services kept for one year. Um, there is a court challenge to that, which is uh, still ongoing. Um, the Association Against Illegal uh, um, mass surveillance uh, actually lost the case in the first instance because the government, the, the Ministry of Justice, argued that the Danish law should not be annulled, rather it should not be applied to the extent that it is against EU law. So th to some extent this is the same situation as in Germany, um, um, although the Danish telecommunications providers are um, retaining the data voluntarily as though the law is still in effect. So. To some extent, that is a sweet spot for the government. Uh, officially, they do not have to apply the data retention law, uh, but telecommunications providers that are respecting it anyhow. Nonetheless, the Danish government has taken upon itself the task of um, adjusting Danish law, uh, claiming that after these adjustments, it will be compatible with the case law of the Court of Justice. So that sounds very interesting. Unfortunately, it's a total exercise in circumventing the court, because in the end, we will have almost exactly the same data retention as we have today. It'll just be sort of relabeled uh, in a way that the government claims it complies with the Court of Justice. And sort of the main vehicle for doing that is the same one used in France, namely data retention for national security. Um, so Denmark is going to claim, similar to what France is doing, that there is a quasi-permanent threat to national security, which justifies the general, <clears throat> the general and indiscriminate retention of all communications data. Um, some of the um, some of the safeguards in the uh, Lagarde II adjustments, uh, such as uh, review by an independent court uh, of these uh, renewable decisions for um, uh, general and indiscriminate data retention are uh, uh, ignored completely. The Minister of Justice says, well, you can sue us if you disagree with our decisions. Um, and by the way, the, uh, uh, your civil court case will not get access to all the evidence that the Minister of Justice used to justify the, um, the, uh, the general and indiscriminate data retention due to a threat to national security. So it's an almost impossible situation. However, it gets even worse because if you have data retention for national security, you would sort of by the principle of purpose limitation, you would assume that it is limited to that purpose only. The Danish government disagrees with that because the retained data, uh, similar to France, can also be used for serious crime. So that is in effect maintaining the current data retention regime, except relabeling it as data retention for national security but mainly used for the purpose of combating serious crime as it is done currently. Um, there's a, a small catch here. The, uh, the Danish government recognizes that there is significant legal uncertainty with this interpretation that it can be used or accessed in cases of, of serious crime. So it's 
actually very possible that that Denmark will will one day send a data retention case to to Luxembourg. So let's see how that goes when the court in <clears throat> when the court of justice believes that every possible question about data retention has been answered. But um, this is not the end of the story in Denmark. Um, so the Minister of Justice is aware that one day it may not be possible to um, to maintain general indiscriminate data retention because it has to be for a time limited period. So that cannot be ready forever. There's also the possibility that uh, the Danish government might lose a court case. So as an insurance policy to, to cover this situation, there's a provision on targeted data retention. Um, this will only kick in if the general and indiscriminate data retention for national security cannot continue. And it's not really targeted because the just like the European Commission, um, Try, obviously, it tries to do with uh, with the non paper that that I described earlier. So the Danish government is is taking the possibilities for Danish, for targeted data retention, adding them together to the extreme. So the the different criterion for above average crime rates um, is defined in a way that makes no adjustment for population density. So any city or city like uh, area in in Denmark will have an above average number of crime cases. And that will be included in the uh, geographical targeted data retention. So, five percent, uh, sort of seventy-five percent of the Danish population lives in five percent of the Danish territory, the, the cities. They will be surveilled just like before. On top of that, you have infra infrastructure sites, every train station, or almost every train station, and the mobile towers um, are selected so that these areas. Areas are covered in full, even though it means surveilling people outside these areas. So, in the end, with the target data retention, something like uh, eighty to ninety percent of the of the Danish population uh, will will be covered. On top of that, there are person-based criteria with every person convicted of a ser of a, of serious crime, every person has been subject to lawful interception criteria mentioned in the uh, in the uh, non-paper from from the commission. Um, and even with all of that, so general and indiscriminate data retention continuing an insurance policy with targeted data retention that covers 80 to 90 percent of the Danish population. The Danish politicians, those that are in favor of data retention, which is a vast majority, complain that they have to um, restrict the law because of the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. And they are saying these are yeah, they are really using rhetoric that, that we would expect from, from Hungary and Poland. Judges lack demo democratic legitimacy. Uh, why should they interfere with, with Danish politics and, and so forth? That is a really terrible situation for, for the rule of law um, in, 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 well, in Denmark and, and, and Europe in, in, in general. Um, so this is sort of, um, yeah, on, on a couple of minor tweaks. Also, there will be mandatory SIM card registration uh, in Denmark. Uh, I think that's one of the last uh, EU member states to, uh, to to introduce that. On, on unfortunately, um, there are a couple of others that that also don't have it yet. Um, and the threshold for serious crime will be lowered as well. So, in effect, even though this is presented as adjusting to the case law of the Court of Justice. We will have, in practice, more data retention, um, and police will have easier access to to the data. Um, I really hope that this does not become a blueprint for how other member states um, in Europe um, adapt to the uh, to the case law from the Court of Justice. But it is unfortunately following the uh, the non paper from the Commission, uh, perhaps putting it to the, to the extreme more than could the Commission intended, uh, but certainly. Um, not the response that, that we hoped for. So uh, the fight in Denmark will, will continue. I can assure you of that. Um, and let me stop here and pass the word back to Friedman. Thank you, Jasper. Yes, uh, I think uh, the fight needs to continue. And um, you said that uh, a lot of data retention politics has to do with uh, circumventing the court and ignoring decisions and the rule of law. And um, on an EU level, a lot of uh, this uh, politics uh, takes place, of course, in process at uh, the European Parliament, at the Commission. So, um, and after hearing this, I, I, yeah, I hope, Chloe, maybe you have some good news for us. What is the situation in, in Belgium? 
I'm afraid not so good uh, news either from Belgium. Um, let me try to, to draw a little bit the situation from what happened since, again, the landmark ruling in October 2020. So um, it's funny, uh, the uh, Constitutional Court in Belgium uh, released uh, its decision following that, uh, that ruling on the 21st of April. So that means one day after the French Council of State gave its decision. Um, and I, I listened to the president of the Court of Justice, uh, who was invited once at the French National Assembly in front of a, of a committee um, specialized in uh, legal affairs and European affairs. And he was saying, oh, don't you imagine that those two, jurors, uh, those two courts obviously talk to each other? And this is why they released their judgment so close to one another. And those are two like very uh, neighboring neighboring country, friend country. So you can imagine that they've discussed and they exchange on their point of view on the CG ruling. And I was like, well, probably if this is the case, they probably like the conclusion of their talks was we agree to disagree um, because the Con Constitutional Court of, of Belgium chose a completely div um, diverging way compared to the French Council of State, which I remind you completely to go completely rogue <laughs> and ignore um, the court's um, main uh, conclusions. The, the Constitutional Court decided to basically implement what the CGU said um, and decided gave um, the Belgium government the task um, to find the solution for itself. So completely something uh, else than the French Council of, of State has done, who, who we, which in its case was really like giving the French government the concrete corrective measures to maintain its regime in place. For in Belgium, it was your legal system is false and um, should is annulled. Now you have to work on the solutions yourself. And so this is what the government has been doing. They have done it for a month only. So a month later, they came up, came up with a bill with a proposal for a new law. Um, and that was proposed by the Council of Ministers. Um, mainly what the bill contained is a is a system, is a regime for targeted retention. So they they are not even like going for the national security mass retention thing. They they try out the targeted uh, retention approach, um, and they mainly focus on the criteria of geographical areas. Um, they also include individual based um, criteria, but mainly they focus on how can we maintain data retention as much as possible based on this geographical um, uh, measures and measurements. Um, and this is basically what Jesper explained for Denmark. Um, this isn't very far from actually including the entire country under this targeted uh, data retention. The way they do that is that they select first like, um, geographical areas that they call by nature sensitive for national security or for uh, any kind of public security. Um, and that includes airports, train station, metro station. So you can already imagine that Brussels is entirely covered. Um, the border zones with like the neighboring countries, hospitals, motorways. There's a lot of motorways in, in, in Belgium, uh, research centers. Um, so everything that has to do with like state innovation, state research and everything, justice and police buildings um, and all infrastructure. And then all the municipalities. So the entire like territory of a municipality of a, of a, of a city, even small, which has uh, on its territory critical infrastructures. So water supply, energy supply, everything. And you can you can already see like it's just this list of geographical like places um, that the government selected, um, given the density, the urban density of Belgium, the the size of the country, it it already covers quite a, a bunch of of people uh, and a large proportion of the population will be submitted to data retention to this targeted just in name uh, retention, and um, they all also use as Denmark the. Uh, average crime rate. Um, this has been criticized heavily by the um, Data Protection Authority in Belgium. Um, they said that they, the Minister of Justice failed to provide any statistic to actually explain why they decided this number, uh, this amount of years, uh, where, and they even criticized the source of the statistics uh, that will be used to determine whether uh, um, judicial district will be uh, subjected to data retention or not um, because the government wants to use a police database 
uh, where crimes are registered, but it's mainly managed and it's exclusively managed by police officers. So there is a high risk and a conflict of interest that police officer would just uh, determine one minor act or one minor offense into a serious crime. And so therefore their uh, police district or their judicial district will fall under data retention. Um, the, the database is called the BNG, uh, the BNG, and it was heavily criticized by journalists in Belgium. They released an entire like investigation into the BNG, um, and they show that the BNG mostly contained false, in, like a lot of false information, rumors, uh, non-verified uh, information or outdated uh, information as well. And so the, the DPA, the Data Protection Authority, required that they use a different database with actual like criminal offense that led to a conviction that led to a criminal sentence, which makes would make more sense, is not even given. So this is all the problems we see with uh, the Belgian bill. Um, this is not limited to that. It's only the two uh, things that I can mention now. Um, there are many other uh, problems that the DPA um, objected to. Um, but for now, the chance we had is that the, this bill also contained um, very dangerous and controversial provisions on um, access to encrypted content. Uh, with the possibility to force uh, service providers to switch off encryption for certain users. And thanks to that, there was enough like um, resistance from civil society and outrage in the public um, to halt a little bit the bill. So now it's still under negotiations with on, um, between the ministers before it is presented to the parliament. Um, but um, we hopefully can also bring some more attention and traction on the data retention provision of this law and try to, um, um, yeah, uh, halt as much as possible the general mass retention of uh, metadata in Belgium as well. Thank you, Chloe. Um, okay, there, there are many, many problems, um, but luckily there's also civil society and there are also freedom advocates. So um, the big question, um, I would really, really like to hear your opinion on is uh, what do you expect from the future? How should um, governments and, uh, but also maybe the commission of the European Union act, what should they do? Um, Let's uh, hear uh, TJ first. Thanks, Friedman. Um, well, I think <laughs> the problem is we know what governments should do, which is comply with the law, and that they're unwilling to do that. So perhaps the question um, could become, what can we do to force them to comply with the law? Now, as civil society, we are collectively already very much overstretched, I think. Um, particularly at the moment, a lot of people are doing this, myself included, as a part-time um, thing. Um, it's unusual to have an organization such as EDRI, uh, which is quite professional um, in this regard, when, particularly in the smaller member states, this tends to be a part-time um, activity for a small number of technologists, a small number of lawyers, and so on. Um, so maybe the first thing everybody should be doing is supporting their local digital rights organization. <laughs> And I think we're probably all agreed on that. Um, otherwise, we're caught in something of a loop here where we're being reactive. Governments put forward um, laws which are ever more draconian, which very often breach existing precedent from the Court of Justice, never mind the uh, Court of Human Rights. And we as civil society have to respond to that very um, expensively. The cost for governments of introducing new measures is relatively speaking low in the sense that um, if it doesn't meet with great domestic political pushback, um, it's quite straightforward for them to push forward new measures. And those measures can often remain in place for months or even years before there is litigation to challenge them, if indeed it's possible in a particular jurisdiction to bring litigation to challenge them. So as civil society, we're always on the back foot here. Um, it is very much a reactive sort of game that we're playing. Ultimately, we need to increase the cost for pushing these kinds of very illiberal measures. Um, and we need to do that 
at the point when those measures are being proposed and adopted. And I think we can learn here from the German experience and the way in which data retention and um, encryption and communications have been baked into the uh, coalition government negotiations. Um, that's something which I think we as voters and advocates need to try to get our governments to do uh, at the point where those governments are being formed. Um, short of that, though, I don't really have any great answer, Freedom and Sorry, and perhaps somebody else might be able to take it further. Um, I think it, it was a, a great answer. Um, and uh, yeah, Patrick, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on the future? <laughs> Well, I can tell uh, for the European Parliament um, that um, um, I, I don't know what majorities would be if the Commission proposed another data retention uh, um, legislation because, you know, having seen what happened with chat control, where they uh, justified even the, the, the scanning of content of communications, uh, blanket, indiscriminate, uh, using the child protection killer argument, I'm not sure that the European Parliament's majority would, would go against uh, uh, another data retention instrument, especially if it uh, claims to, to abide by the European Court of Justice uh, jurisprudence. And also, I'm very outraged at the European Data Protection Supervisor, who in those court hearings that we've discussed earlier, actually uh, undermines the ECJ jurisprudence and says, you know, what matters is access to data, not so much the storage. It's really outrageous. So, but one good thing from the European Parliament is that in the pending um, trilogue on the e-privacy regulation, uh, on the reform, um, the majority agrees that uh, we won't accept to have data retention in that specific instrument because it's about e-privacy and not about e-surveillance. Uh, so what I'm uh, trying to do at the EU uh, level is to, to push back in the very early stages of the political process. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very happy that I, I found Friedemann to, to, to support uh, my work. Um, last year, I've commissioned a study by the European Parliament's Research Service to compare crime rates throughout the EU. I've already told you about that. And currently, I've commissioned a, a poll to find out the, the public opinion on data retention in several EU uh, countries. We'll have the results early next year. And um, uh, I will also commission a legal opinion, uh, um, ask a former um, Court of Justice, European Court of Justice judge, to uh, write a legal opinion on the French resurrection of, of indiscriminate data retention, because that is a model that they are using, um, more and more countries are using. Uh, so if you have any more ideas uh, about what we could do at EU level, please um, let me know. Thank you. Um, well, uh, Chloe, what, what what do you expect um, of the future or maybe 2022 from your entry European rights NGO perspective? Sure. Um, well, we'll continue obviously monitoring the situation at EU levels, just like Patrick does, only like with our network of experts and NGO. Um, obviously looking at what the commission has in mind and where this like long year process of like thinking how all of this can be like put together and uh, uh, enable uh, mass data retention without like um, uh, <laughs> without like uh, insulting too much the court of justice uh, will lead to actually um, that would be obviously one of our main uh, tasks for the future. Um, we'll continue, as I said, as a network to monitor what's going on at national level. Um, so, and as TG said, we are lacking resources, especially at national level, to follow all the twenty-seven. Uh, jurisdiction. So if you're just interested and it's in your country, I would just advise um, uh, viewers now to um, look at look up on Edris website uh, our map of, of uh, members and you can join and get in touch with uh, some of them um, at their contact email address. Um, if you want to lend a hand and uh, contribute to just monitoring, because the, the first step of what we're doing as civil society is just bring a light to those developments, because mo most of the cases, 
like in many times it's just going under the radar. Um, the media isn't picking up the stories so quickly as uh, we would like them to do. Um, and uh, all those kind of really rights violating measures can go unchecked uh, without any kind of de democratic pushback or anything. So this is the kind of the first that I would recommend for viewers to do, to do if they want to uh, get engaged is basically join us, um, follow us on um, the social media, follow our website. Edri has a newsletter where each and every members of Edri can contribute and write and even guest, uh, guest uh, writers sometimes. Um, if you want to write about um, the situation in your country and you've, you've investigated a little bit the state of play, please uh, talk to us and drop us an email. Everything is obviously a uh, all the information of content can be found on our, web on our website. Um, and you can obviously subscribe to this newsletter. Um, if you want to go a bit further and get really engaged, it's like the step, the, the kind of the scale of engagement, you can join us on our uh, mailing list dedicated to the topic, data retention, just by dropping me an email. Uh, if you're really into it and want to contribute actively to the analysis, to um, possible future campaigns or... Uh, any kind of advocacy actions we're organizing at EU level. Um, and then that's what kind of the, I think I didn't forget anything you can do as viewers. Um, in general, what we're looking for, uh, we'll try to push the commission. It's, it's, I think it's a dead wish, but I will mention it nonetheless. Uh, we would like the commission to do, uh, to launch infringement procedures against countries that do not um, comply with the CG ruling. Um, as I said, it's a dead wish because this is a highly political topic. Um, the commission has stated multiple times in public that it won't do this. Um, they're not interested in doing this. They're interested in being in a cooperative state of mind or <laughs> spirit of collaboration with member states to find solutions. Another word for saying we will ignore what the ruling what the ruling says and try to find solutions that can work out and that avoid us like the painful and uh, embarrassing situation of having a future EU legal instruments being struck down by their own courts. Um, but yeah, this is to be seen. Uh, we'll work together with Jesper. I don't know if you have anything to add, Jesper, to that if I forgot something. No, I think so even monitoring the situation in, in 27 member states is, is a huge task and we, we definitely need uh, help on this. Um, so Denmark is, is well covered, uh, but there are, there's also uh, Sweden, um, um, yeah, uh, many, many different member states. Um, and mostly the uh, you have governments that like data retention and either try to just ignore the court of justice or as Denmark is doing, make um, adjustments to the national law that are not real adjustments, but just try to maintain what, what is already in place um, under the guise of adjusting to the court of justice. Or we have talked about France, Denmark, Belgium as, as cases that, that really try to circumvent the, uh, the case law. So keeping one, one, definite risk here is that data retention will be forgotten. That is what member states want so that nobody talks about it. Uh, so we need to, um, yeah, we need to keep the public debate going, uh, make sure that contact journalists, make sure that they write about data retention and and also I think focus on the, the rule of law problem that is associated with this uh, because it's really not a sustainable situation that all member states are ignoring fundamental rights. Um, in the end, everything sounds also a little bit promising. <laughs> and um, at least let's not forget, this is about, um, it's about the citizens, it's about the people, it's about their data, it's about their governments, it's about their freedoms. Um, do you have, or do you would like to, to add something? Um, I mean, uh, here is the speakers. Um, if not, um, you still have time to interrupt me. Um, we can have, I would hand over to, to Walter and we can, uh, we just go into the Q&A uh, part of the talk. And I would uh, thank everybody to um, for joining this talk. Um, also, thank you 
to the speakers. It's been really, really interesting. And um, to everybody who liked the talk, uh, you can recommend it and you can get the audio and video to download um, on media.ccc. And uh, of course, join the discussion on data retention by using the hashtag uh, data retention or the hashtag uh, that is used in your language. So, um, but, uh, before um, we go into the questions that have, we already have uh, collected through uh, Mastodon, IRC, Matrix, and, and Twitter, uh, TJ wanted to add something earlier on uh, while Chloe was still talking, I remember. Thanks, correct, Walter. Chloe's, um, Chloe's point uh, reminded me of something that um, I was very impressed with from the German campaign against data retention, which um, was the great use of civil society, so groups uh, representing journalists, lawyers, uh, medical professionals, and so on, to make the point that communications confidentiality is important for them too. Um, and that's something I have to admit that we didn't do to the same extent in Ireland, um, but it's certainly something we've tried to do. And I think to the extent that anybody listening to this now is from a group where they have a professional interest in communications confidentiality, I think it's a good thing if you can work through your group to try to develop that. It might be uh, that you're in an area such as technical security. It might be that you're in um, an area such as the legal profession or the medical profession or the like. But if you as a professional have a, spe a special um, interest in communications confidentiality, then it would be a good idea to not just go to your local digital rights group, but also see if you can take this up through your own professional body. Okay, thank you. Um, since I am the moderator for the Q&A questions, uh, then I also sort of get to rephrase the questions as passed on through me, through the internet. And the most recent question, but I think also the most fascinating question is, uh, uh, someone is asking, uh, to what extent the Gaia-X program and the Palantir collaborations in the EU tied to this and what can be done to stop this. And for those who are unfamiliar with Gaia-X, uh, that's an initiative to create a, a European-based, Europe-based uh, uh, cloud service. Uh, but it should be mentioned that uh, all sorts of American tech companies are also participants in that. So the European nation of that could be disputed. But um, to get back to the question, how does Gaia-X and Palantir uh, may or may not tie into this? I think that might be a question for Patrick. I'm afraid I don't know enough to, to answer it, Walter. Um, uh, Palantir has, has their hands, of course, in, in managing databases and they will also offer uh, products to police that will integrate um, uh, data retention. And of course, the impact of uh, communications data uh, grows potentially with the capacities to analyze this data. It has long been established that, um, you know, the idea that, that listening in to phone calls was, was more sensitive than uh, 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 only knowing the, the, the call details is wrong nowadays because you can use the, 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 the bulk of data that has been um, collected over weeks and months to, to paint a picture of, of persons and their networks and their movements and their personalities that is actually um, uh, uh, much, much more impressive and much more sensitive than what you can tell from, from just listening into uh, to phone calls. And um, yes, I think uh, companies such as Palanty are taking this to, to very great length um, with the, the products they are offering. And um, certainly it's, it's a commercial incentive. Um, uh, mass surveillance is big business and we need to be uh, very aware of this. Okay, I will also ask Jesper this because he may have some thoughts on this as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think um, another worrying development we we are seeing is with the uh, amendment to the uh, to the Europol regulation, um, which to a large extent is about allowing big data analysis uh, um, and, in fact, legalizing uh, practices that 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 uh, that are currently illegal. Um, I could easily imagine that. Uh, so. 
police authorities will not have access to the sort of complete data sets that are retained by telecommunications providers. But whenever they have a criminal investigation and get access to some data, there's a risk that this will be stored in the database and used for for other purposes. Uh, I could easily see that uh, systems from from Palantir could could be used for for analyzing um, such data. That it could be um, disclosed to, uh, to to Europol um, and possibly analyzed by by Europol using using perhaps Palantir Palantir software as well. So, even though the the connection to sort of Palantir and Gaia X is, is a bit speculative. Um, it certainly fits the picture of more big data analysis for, for the police. Okay, uh, Chloe, you want to add something to that? Just a quick like remark uh, on the, um, it's not linked to Palantir directly or GAX, but like this is also part of the, um, uh, the um, French law that was actually brought down by the, um court of justice I, like one part was also like about black boxes used by intelligent services so not police authorities not law enforcement authorities but intelligent services um and the new like loi renseignement so like the revival or the reform of the former uh law um in that was adopted this year that i mentioned before also contains this kind of algorithmic um based big data analysis of metadata of communications data and this is even like further expanded in the new uh, law um by including uh urls so also an analysis of uh internet network um and the, the how visit websites uh are being visited and which ones and by whom and in general um, and all of this will be done now from the premises of, uh, like the the physical premises of the intelligent services in France, and no longer at the at the premises of the service providers. Um, so it's kind of a huge shift where like intelligent services are getting a copy of metadata um, on the basis of a judge uh, decision, but basically everything is copied and then they're like applying an algorithmic analysis to it. Um, something that is obviously not known by the public. Um, this is in, in, in the sense it's, it follows the same trend. Okay, thank you. Another question from the audience is, and I think I'm going to give that one to TJ, uh, because this may also require a expansion into other fundamental rights or a broader set of fundamental rights. Someone is wondering what is actually so bad about uh, a general data retention for just IP addresses for just severe crimes, TJ? Um, well, that's a very good question. So first of all, what do we mean um, by just serious crimes? In Ireland, a serious crime includes um, stealing a Mars bar from your local shop or a uh, suite of your choice from your local shop because that theoretically carries a possible seven-year prison sentence. And in fact, um, the Irish police have been using this so-called serious crime provision to investigate um, things like the theft of a mobile phone from a locker and the theft of 100 euro from an um, ATM machine. So first of all, the um, problem here is that scope creep is a thing. And even if you describe something as being limited to serious crime, it's no guarantee that what you think of a serious crime and what it will be used for are in fact the same things. The second is that registration um, of any sort is a gateway to registration of everything. Um, the kinds of registration we see talked about and Jesper mentioned already and Patrick has fought against in different contexts, um, registration of SIM cards, for example, um, generally require identity verification of some sort. And that in turn is a real threat then to um, people who rely on confidentiality, the whistleblowers who want to get information about what government is doing out to you, um, the people who want to talk to their doctors or their uh, support helplines and confidence. Um, and that is a threat to them. But I think P Patrick probably is a better place to discuss those points than I am. So perhaps I'll just hand over to him. Just to add what, to what uh, TJ said about IP addresses specifically, um, on the internet, the, the major um, uh, providers of services will log your every uh, uh, click and, and search term that you enter and keep that there for months. And so basically, if you know a person's IP addresses, it's easy to request 
uh, uh, from Google uh, uh, all um, the search terms that they entered. Or um, if somebody is publishing anonymously using a Twitter account, or they think it's anonymously, then you'll um, you'll ask for the IP address, and you can establish, you can lift the anonymity of the, that whole account, and um, that's why uh, uh, IP addresses uh, or tra being able to trace IP addresses really means that you can follow uh, whatever a person has has done on the internet, and you can even um, determine their location because um, the IP address tells about um, your, your movements more or less roughly, uh, whether you are at home or at work can be determined according to uh, research. And uh, it's very telling. It's, it's not true that it's somehow less uh, sensitive. Uh, you know, um, if, if you call, if you call somebody and, and suppress your, your phone number, you can't, you wouldn't be allowed to, um, to, to retain data on this. But if you use um, digital services to, to send an email, you'll have the IP address in the header. If um, you use messaging services, they will be logging your IP address. So very similar things as, as uh, making uh, uh, phone calls uh, will be able to be um, retained uh, indiscriminately and retracing the IP address. Okay, I have a very specific question about closed bit um, in the presentation. Um, the, the person listening in uh, didn't quite get what the Socialist Party did block and how and, and what happened there. Sure, that went very fast. It's not just the Socialists. Obviously, I forgot to mention that the right parties had a big role to play in there. Um, basically, there is like a procedure in France every time like a legislation is adopted by the parliament, so both the national French, the French National Assembly and the Senate, um, there is a possibility, um, there's this rule where either 60 senators or 60 MPs, member of, of the National Assembly, can just vote in favor of submitting the bill before it's adopted and officially published in the official journal. Uh, and can come into force, there is this possibility of submitting it to the Constitutional um, Council. So the Constitutional Council in France is composed of nine members. They are not elected, they are designated. So it's not the best kind of democratic counter um, power you can imagine, but this is still there and has been proven effective in the past years, especially since the presidency of Macron, um, to a little bit um, hold responsible what the government is proposing and has annulled or uh, prevented some provision in several security laws to pass and to come into effect. Um, and so for the second, the loi renseignement 2, so like the reform of the intelligence service law that contains the provision about data retention. Um, so when this reform was finally like adopted by both the Senate and the National Assembly, um, there wasn't the majority, there wasn't an, a good an, an enough majority to send the text in front of the constitutional court, or at least not on the provision related to data retention. And some other provision contained in the bill were sent to the constitutional council. Um, and the reason why data retention wasn't included is because the socialists didn't support it, this submission this reference to the Constitutional Council. So it's not just the socialist fault, it's also obviously the right parties and the party in power, so the La, La République En Marche. Um, but um, I think once uh, assumption that we can make, and this is not like verified <laughs> information, but this is one assumption we can make, is that the reason why the socialists didn't support it, um, the submission to uh, uh, another scrutiny, a constitutional scrutiny, uh, is because they were the ones introducing those measures in 2015 when they were in power under François Hollande. So. I've been told by the translators that uh, we really have to wrap it up. So I probably will be asking the last question, depending on the length of the answer, maybe another question. And I'm going to ask that to Friedemann because he hasn't been uh, much talking much during the Q and A. Uh, one of the questions is, and that was uh, by a viewer who understood um, the explanations about the Court of Justice as potentially be willing to revise 
the uh, earlier jurisprudence on the um, uh, on data retention, which I quite understood quite differently. So maybe you could explain that as well. But the question is, in case the Court of Justice of the European Union were to revisit its earlier opinions and weaken its stance, uh, what would be possible to do against that as a citizen? Well, uh, to be honest, I would love to uh, pass this question on to the speakers, since I'm not actually a speaker of this talk and just um, kind of a host or moderator. So, um, would somebody of the speakers take the question? And then I suggest Chloe does it. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a nice gift. Can I pass the ball to Jasper? <laughs> I don't know what can be done as a citizen's country the Court of Justice future uh, rulings. One thing that Patrick mentioned, for example, is the uh, influence of several um, interventions during hearings in front of the courts. And notably when the European Data Protection uh, Supervisor is kind of weakening what the court has said previously and said that access is more important than the mere um, retention of data, it's problematic. It's it, even though it, it didn't impact it this time too much, there is a risk that this kind of narratives build up and and becomes like very influential um, at in the in the judges' ears. Um, so this is something to be avoided. But Jasper, please complete because I'm probably far from the a, a comprehensive answers to this question. Yeah, things are in in the hypothetical situation that that the uh, the court would revise its position and say allow general and indiscriminate data retention not just for national security in extraordinary circumstances but for combating serious crime in in general um that would put us back to sort of square one before the uh, the the uh, the so when the campaigning against data retention started and then we can no longer say that it's against fundamental rights, um, but it's still a bad idea. It still has problems for vulnerable groups, uh, persons with pro professional privileges, and 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 so forth. Um, so in that situation, ideally, we want to com convince our parliamentarians at the national level that it's a bad idea, and if that is not possible, at least make exceptions uh, so that these groups with professional privileges are not included in data retention. It may be possible Germany has, in its current data retention law, has some provisions on where, where certain phone numbers of help groups, uh, help uh, phone lines are excluded. Um, and also make sure that, that access to this data is subject to prior court review. That is not the case in all member states. Um, and that access is exceptional also. Um, so these are the, the, the options remaining um, should the Court of Justice revise its position, which I would consider unlikely at this age, and certainly if the Advocate General is in, in the free, case, free cases pending, is not suggesting this at all, rather the contrary. Okay, thank you. And um, we have run out. And uh, well, uh, oh, also for those who want to look up the website, uh, it's edgy.org. And that contains the map uh, Chloe mentioned. But again, thank you all. And uh, this is it for this session. Take care. Bye bye.